Well, hello, Nats fans, and welcome to another edition of the Dodcast Post Game Show. I'm Drew Douglas, and I'll be your host tonight after a great game for the Nationals when they won five to nothing. And this game was really filled with everything from a great outing uh, from Gio Gonzalez in uh, the first game back from the All Star break uh, to great offense from especially Bryce Harper, who absolutely crushed two home runs, which we'll get into that a little bit later to um, great defense from guys like Anthony Rendon, Wilmer Defoe, and Brian Goodwin. And then uh, yet another bullpen meltdown. Obviously, they didn't uh, blow the game. They didn't even allow a run as the Nationals won 5 to nothing. But, boy, that was a lot more interesting at the end than you'd expect from a 5 nothing game where your starting pitcher goes eight and a third innings and uh, pitches into the ninth inning. So, I thought it was a great game all around, uh, other than bullpen. But yeah, that was an exciting one. And here we'll get into the totals a little bit here. Had a uh, Brian Goodwin still leading off while Trey Turner is out, and Goodwin is now shifted from left field to center field with the uh, injury to Michael Taylor. So he went one one for five tonight with another run scored. He's done a great job in the leadoff spot. He led off tonight's game with a with a double down the right field line and ended up scoring the first run of the game. So. That's always what you'd like to see. There's not many better outcomes from the first batter of the game. And, uh, and then he crushed another ball into the into right field, and Scott Shebler made a nice play on it to rob him of what was most likely extra bases. So Goodwin has had an excellent year uh, at the top of the Nets lineup and filling in for various guys in the outfield after he started the year in AAA and maybe didn't even expect to see much playing time in the bigs at all. Uh, Wilmer Defoe in the two hole. He's one in five, and the Nationals get yet another win uh, with Wilmer Defoe in the starting lineup. I know, not sure what the updated stat is, but last week at one point the Nats were 17 and four in games that he starts. So he's just he's provided some great uh, energy, and he's been phenomenal uh, playing multiple positions: second, short, third, a little bit of center field. Didn't that didn't work out too well? But you know, he's an infielder by trade, so it's not it's no surprise that looked a little bit uncomfortable in center field. And I thought the story of the offense really tonight was Bryce Harper, who went two for four with three runs scored, three RBIs, and a walk. Uh, his two hits were both home runs. And uh, that first home run, that was that was incredible. It was just both of them were no doubters, but that first one, most, most of the time he had no doubter. It's a big, lofty fly ball. It goes a long ways, but it's like – he goes way up in the air and moonshot. And this one was just a line drive. It crushed it 112 miles per hour off the bat. And you're not going to see many balls hit harder than that. And, uh, especially uh, for, well, in Bryce Harper, you see he wasn't in the home run uh, home run derby the other day. But he said it's going to, when it comes back next year to D.C., if he makes the All-Star team, which you think he would, especially if he has a little bit of an off year next year maybe, um, it's really a popularity contest. The fans should vote him in, especially with the game being in D.C. It'll be fun to see what he's able to do against uh, just batting practice pitchers if he's able to hit 112 mile per hour shots off of real big league pitchers. So he had that home run, and then he had another one. His very next at bat went 440 feet to dead center. So you know he's just he's really locked in right now. It should be a lot of fun to watch him throughout the second half as he pushes for yet another MVP award. Um, and then Matt Wieters also had a great game tonight. He went two for three with a walk. And he, the one chance he had defensively to throw out a runner, he threw it into center field. So you don't really like to see that. But he was really scuffling at the plate before the break. And he's catching a ton. He's catching like eight out of every 10 games, I think. So, you know, maybe the break was good for him. And we'll start to see uh, some more offensive production from him, like we saw in April when he hit nearly 400. So, you know, if if that break was good for him, then that's phenomenal since the Nats are missing guys like Trey Turner and Michael Taylor. So if Weeders can uh, start hitting again, that would be an excellent addition for this Nationals team. Uh, we'll check the chat real quick. Judo Joker says, how many Nats bullpen pitchers are going to get a save this year? Dusty giving them out like Oprah. That's a great point. And, you know, now add Matt Grace to the list. He came in tonight to get his first major league save. and. You really wouldn't expect someone to be able to get a save in a 5 nothing game, but the base is loaded and the tying run in the on-deck circle, you know, it is a, it is in fact a save situation. So 
I'm not sure how many guys will be able to say uh, that they got their first major league save in a five nothing game. So, you know, Matt Grace, I'd like to see the numbers on that. I think Matt Grace is definitely in special company if he's not all alone in that regard. And uh, another main story for tonight was Gio Gonzalez after not making the all-star team, being snubbed for the all-star team after he's been saying all year that that was his goal. He came out tonight in the first game back from the break and just pitched lights out against Cincinnati. He went eight and a third, only allowed four hits, and three of them were infield hits. So he really only allowed one hit um, on two walks and six strikeouts. And he really had everything working tonight, I thought. He had uh, he had his big Bugs Bunny curveball working well. He was able to locate his fastball well, keeping it low in the zone. He was getting a ton of ground balls. He got 13 ground outs as opposed to four flyouts. So – you know, it, when, with Geo, if he's getting ground balls, that's when he's right. You don't want to see the ball up in the air. Uh, he's got a little bit of a tendency to give up some long home runs. But, yeah, if he's keeping the ball down, he's got good command of that curveball and his secondary pitches, he's he's really tough to hit. And he, we really saw that tonight. So I thought that was an outstanding outing for him, one of the best that I've seen in his tenure in D.C. So, and then he was also very efficient, which, you know, it's not really something that you can usually say about Gio. In his eight and a third innings, he only threw 113 pitches, which is quite a few. But, I mean, to be pitching into the ninth inning, I'll take that any day. And and he, his efficiency really allowed him to go back into the ninth because he had an eight-pitch inning in the eighth, which allowed Dusty to let him go into the ninth, get the matchup, face the lefty, Joey Votto, which he got – to retire, he retired him, got him to fly out and to left. So yeah, I I couldn't really have been more impressed with Geo tonight. As also discussing Weeders called an excellent game tonight. It can never be overlooked this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yesterday when we had Byron Kerr on the show, uh, he was asked about Geo, and he said he's been very impressed with Geo, and he thinks what has possibly Attributed to, his, attributed to his success has been his pace. He's been pitching much, much quicker this year. He's not taking as much time between pitches. And uh, Byron Kerr, along with giving credit to Gio, obviously, he gave a lot of that credit to Matt Wieters. So I think although Matt Wieters hasn't hit much since his outstanding month of April, he has been very good defensively with calling the game, handling the staff. So, yeah, th that's an excellent point. Wieters did call a great game. And he says, Sean Kelly once gave up a grand slam and got a save. Yeah, the whole wins and losses and saves, its they're weird stats. I don't pay too much attention to them. Just they're, I think they're all flawed in their own in their own ways. So, yeah, that's Sean, like Sean Kelly's save along with Matt Grace's first career save tonight are definitely weird ones. So another thing, he pitched with so much urgency and not much time in the set position. Yeah, absolutely. That goes back to what Kerr was saying about the pace. Uh, Geo has looked – He's looked phenomenal this year, and it's great to see him pitching so well after some people thought he wouldn't even be back this year. You know, he had a great year in 2012 in his first season with the Nationals, and since then he's been uh, pretty erratic. But, you know, to see him putting together the kind of year that he is this year, it's been it's been a lot of fun to watch. He's one of my personal favorites, and I think a lot of Nats fans really love uh, seeing Gio pitch so well this year. Uh, we'll go a little bit into – Cincinnati's line, Billy Hamilton went one for four with a hit. That was an infield single, of course. With his speed, you know, if he can put the ground if he can put the ball on the ground, it's gonna to be tough to retire him. Adam Duvall was the only hitter with uh, multiple hits. He went two for four. And uh really what happened uh what really kind of put the Reds at a disadvantage was the rough start from Edelman tonight. He only managed to go four and a third, four and one third innings. Uh, he allowed seven hits and five runs. And the fact that he couldn't even make it through five innings in the first game of a four-game series, I think, is huge for the Nationals. Because now, although we just had the All-Star break, and the Reds, uh, their bullpen was resting up during the break. To have uh, four pitchers coming out of the bullpen tonight, I mean, now the bullpen is already uh, pretty tired. And so moving forward with a four-game series, you got one tonight and three more coming up. It'll be interesting to see how the Reds' bullpen fares uh, after being a little fatigued. Um, Drew Storen, former national, he came in the night, he threw one inning, allowed one hit, a double to Matt Wieters, but he also struck out two. So 
it's kind of funny. The only out that uh, wasn't a strikeout was Gio Gonzalez, who grounded out. And it was cool to see him and Storm kind of messing with each other. Uh, it was the ground ball to first base. The Storm went over, did his job, and covered the bag. But then he and uh, Gio had a little fun with each other. So that's always cool to see two former teammates, two guys that I believe are pretty – Storin, he like he had his mishaps in the in the playoffs, but I think Nats fans still think pretty highly of him. So, two guys that Nats fans like having a little fun with each other—that's always cool. Um, we will go through the uh, minor leagues a little bit tonight because we got a lot of uh, off the or not off the field, but kind of additional moves to cover tonight. So we had a. Uh, the Class A short season, Auburn, Auburn Double Days are still in progress. They're tied with Vermont six to six in the in the bottom of the eighth. So that's it's a high scoring game. I guess there's not much pitching down in uh, Class A. Um, in Triple A, which was the main the main game with uh, Eric Fetty starting that, we'll get into that a little later. They lost eight to one to Pawtucket. So that's you know. Uh, we'll get into Fetty and Solis also appeared tonight. We'll get into that in a minute. Double uh, A Harrisburg Sanders, they lost four to three to Richmond. Uh, Class A Advanced Potomac Nationals lost five nothing to Salem. Uh, the Hagerstown Suns in Low A they lost six nothing to Charleston. And the Gulf Coast League Nationals beat the Gulf Coast League Cardinals six to four. So luckily there is there's some winning going on in the minor leagues. Is Obviously, a good night for the big league club, but not a whole lot going on in the minor leagues. Um, the big game tonight in AAA Syracuse, Eric Fetty got the start. It was, I believe, his third start since moving back into the rotation. Uh, he he went three and two-thirds, allowed three hits one in one earned run with one strikeout. So he only went three and two-thirds, but they're still stretching him back out after he spent quite a bit, or quite a bit of time as a reliever. Um, so... He'll continue to be stretched out, and maybe we'll see him. Byron Cruz seemed to think that we'll see Fetty before September. Maybe we'll see him as a long man in the bullpen if the Nats bullpen can't figure things out soon. Maybe we'll see him in Joe Ross's spot because we'll get into that a little later, but it's not looking good for Ross, and we don't know when we're, we, don't, uh, we don't know when we're going to see him back. So it'll be an interesting thing to keep an eye on. And also Sammy Solis, who was recently sent down, Tonight, it was his first game in AAA since the demotion. He went one inning, allowed one hit and one run, which was the uh, which was the homer. So, you know, home runs happen. You don't like to see it, but it certainly is a part of the game. But the thing that I really don't like to see is he allowed two walks. So, you know, Sammy Solis, he's, after last year being a really reliable reliever and uh, Dusty, who's Dusty's go-to left-hander this year, he struggled a little bit, had a long DL stint, and now is, came back to the big league team and struggled some more. So he's he's not right. He's been sent down to try to figure things out, and he's still struggling in Syracuse. So we'll have to keep an eye on him and hope he can uh, soon figure things out. Um, <laughs> Judah Joker said, which is more difficult spelling and – I don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name, so I'm just going to call him Wojo. It was the Cardinals reliever, Asher Wojo. Uh, he came in. He said, which is more difficult, spelling his name or hitting his stuff? And to be honest, I don't know because he really came in, shut down the Nats tonight. Uh, let me look at his exact line, but I know he had a he definitely had a good night. He pitched two innings, didn't allow a single hit, and struck out four batters. So, yeah, he had a good, na he had a good night, and his name is, for me at least, near impossible to spell. So <laughs> that's a good question. Keeler, he said, eight ground outs for Fetty. Fetty, definitely a good sign. Just had a lot of three ball counts. So, yeah, that's that, he's right. That's definitely a good sign. Hopefully he can keep progressing, keep getting his arms stretched out some more, and we'll see him possibly soon up with the big league team. So, yeah, three, big league, or three ball counts, that definitely makes sense, as it took him 61 pitches to go just three and two-thirds. So be a little more efficient, pound the zone a little more, and then uh, – We'll start to see him possibly go four or five innings and then get called up in the near future. Uh, we'll get more into the all the moves from today. Um, the big news was Joe Ross, who the Nats officially placed him on the 10-day disabled list today and uh, with an elbow sprain, as they were called it. And the other day when he got hurt and had to leave the game against Atlanta, 
uh, it was diagnosed as triceps tenderness, and he got an MRI. So we haven't heard the exact MRI results, but elbow sprain doesn't sound good. As Chelsea James pointed out, a strain would be a muscle tear and a stretch, but a sprain, which is what Ross has, is a ligament. So if he's got some ligament issues in his elbow, that's never a good sign. Dusty really didn't seem to uh, – he didn't seem too positive about it. So, I mean, he said they're prepared to be without him for a long time. It makes elbow ligament and him being out possibly a long time, it kind of makes you think of possibly is it a UCL issue, which most – most of the time requires Tommy John. So, I mean, you don't like to speculate on things like this, but, I mean, you really don't know when or if we'll see Ross again this year. And that's really a shame because he struggled a little bit uh, at the beginning of the year. He got demoted at one point. But recently he's really he really pitched a lot better. And so it'll be a shame if this is indeed a season-ending injury or if he is back, definitely be out. Uh, quite quite a bit of time, a significant DL stint. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. Uh, yesterday in AAA, Jacob Turner and Edwin Jackson both pitched. So Ross's spot is coming up on Tuesday against the Angels. So they'll be on pace or on schedule to pitch on Tuesday. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. They're both guys who have started in the past. Uh, Jacob Turner looked good at times with the big league team. At other times, he looked completely lost down the mound and. He's really struggled in his return to Syracuse. He's no longer on the 40-man roster. So I don't know if he'll be the move. Edwin Jackson also isn't on the 40-man roster, but there are guys you could see uh, taking off the 40. Or if Joe Ross does indeed need Tommy John, obviously you can put him on the 60-day DL, which would um, remove him from the 40. So there are a couple different ways you could see uh, you could see a move made to call up a starter. AJ Cole, he is on the 40, but he hasn't been, I mean, he hasn't been very impressive in the big leagues. I personally wouldn't really like to see him get called up. I'd prefer an Edwin Jackson, who, although he struggled with Baltimore earlier this year, has pitched very well in Syracuse. So, I mean, we've seen him in DC before. He was with the team in 2012, had a decent year, didn't do too much out of the pen, but he had a decent year starting. So I guess so it'll be interesting to see who they call up to start on Tuesday. I know my personal preference would be Edwin Jackson, but yeah, that'll definitely be something to keep an eye on. And it'll be something to keep an eye on with uh, what happens with Ross and when we see him back. So hopefully it's not Tommy John, but with Dusty fearing the worst and it's a ligament issue in his elbow, it's definitely something that comes to mind. So, um, We'll have to keep an eye on that. And with Ross going on the DL, he cleared up a roster spot. And with Sammy Solis getting sent down the other day and no, and no one getting called up, there were two roster slots open today. And the Nats filled them by calling up relievers. Trevor Gott, who was acquired in the Unel Escobar trade before the 2016 season, and Austin Adams, who was acquired in the Danny Espinosa trade prior to this season. So we've seen some of Gott before. Last year, he was a September call-up. He pitched very well, I thought. This year, didn't make the team at spring training. He was one of the last cuts and eventually got called up, struggled a little bit, and got sent back down. So it would be interesting to see how he fares. And Austin Adams, we've never seen him in the big leagues with the Nationals. So um, he's one of our personal favorites here at District on Deck. We've had the privilege of being able to interview him. So um It'll be cool to see him hopefully make his debut sometime before Tuesday when you think maybe he's the guy who gets sent down to clear a roster spot for uh, for whoever comes up to start in Ross's place. So the Nats have a couple new relievers out in the pen. And sticking with that, I thought tonight in a five-run game in the ninth inning, I personally would have gone with Austin Adams or Trevor Gott. I'm not sure why I have them on the roster if you're going to – if you're not going to use them in a five-run game, if you're not like if you're not going to use them in a five-run game, you could call up an extra bat, like an Andrew Stevenson, who's someone who could actually play center field in the case of a Brian Goodwin injury. So I'm I definitely disagreed with the decision from Dusty to bring in Matt Albers in the ninth inning of five-run game, who he's seemingly your closer. So I'm not exactly sure how that decision was made, but you know. Was made and that's one. I guess move on, but 
Uh, in the future, in a situation like that, I'd like to see a guy like Austin Adams or Trevor Gott get a shot there in a five-run game. Um, some more uh, organizational moves, or not organizational moves, but injury updates. We had we heard about Jason Worth, who the Nets were hoping could maybe return soon, and he just has not been. Today we heard he has not been progressing as they had hoped, and they really don't know when he'll be back. So with him and Michael Taylor on the disabled list. We're going to continue to see Brian Goodwin in center field and uh, and a platoon possibly of Chris Heisey and Ryan Rayburn in left field. So that's it's not encouraging that they don't know when Worth will be back. You know, at the beginning of June when they were in Oakland, he fouled that ball off his foot. Fortunately, it was not broken, but I guess it was very severely bruised and he's missed quite a bit of time because of it. So now, hopefully we'll see him back in the lineup soon. He's a great veteran presence, always is able to put up great at-bats at, towards the top of the lineup. So uh, it'll be interesting to keep an eye on when he comes back because, you know, they really thought that he'd be back either by now or sometime in the near future. But I guess that foot just isn't healing as they had hoped. So uh, we may not see him back for a while. And then more injury news. Uh, Coda Glover, who's been out for um, a little over a month now with various injuries. He has the back back issues and also some issues when he, with his uh, throwing shoulder. Today, it was announced that he is currently uh, rehabbing in West Palm Beach. So, you know, with all these bullpen issues and a little bit of uh, n- nobody really knows who the closer is, it would be great to get Coda Glover back as soon as possible. He, when healthy, he has the potential to be an elite closer. So maybe if he comes in, pitches a ninth, and he's able to stay on the field, uh, everyone else could kind of uh, fall into roles. Maybe the bullpen, bullpen uh, finally gets, finally can improve a little bit. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. Hopefully Glover is able to return within the next couple of weeks. He's currently in West Palm Beach. You'd think after that they'll probably send him on – a rehab assignment for at least a couple games. But I think if he could come back and and stay healthy, that would be a huge be a huge break for this Nationals team who really needs something to go right in that bullpen right now. And then Francisco Rodriguez, who the Nationals had signed a couple weeks ago with the hope that maybe he could find what – or he could return to his form from a couple years ago when he was one of the elite closers in the league. Uh, they signed him to a minor league deal. And today they released him, just wasn't working out. So uh, he he struggled in Detroit this year. He went down in the minors, thought it was interesting. He went to double A as opposed to going to triple A where he's facing some batters who have, they have some major league experience. So that threw up some red flags right there, the fact that he went to double A. But they finally decided to you know cut the cord on that move. Uh, didn't, I mean, I guess I didn't really have a huge problem with it. Just signing him to a minor league contract, you don't really owe him anything. And if he if he struggles, you know, he's struggling in double A or triple A. He's not he's not struggling in your big league bullpen. So I guess it didn't really hurt them too much. But um, it's good to see that the Nets finally decided that it just wasn't going to work out because you know he's a couple years ago I would love to have him in his bullpen, but he's just way past his prime. And, maybe time to hang him up for him. So it'll be interesting to see if maybe another team uh, gives him a shot. I don't know. Maybe he could go to a struggling team and find lightning in a ball, use him as a trade chip or work with some younger relievers. I guess he could still provide a little bit of value to a non-contender, but he's definitely not going to be closing out meaningful games for a, or for a team in the playoff hunt. That's for sure. Um, go around the division a little bit. We had some uh, some blowouts tonight. Uh, Baltimore, uh, Baltimore, the other DC area team, they're playing the Cubs, and they've come back quite a bit. They were losing eight to two. Kevin Gossman got roughed up quite a bit. He allowed uh, eight runs in the first three innings alone. Uh, he struggled this year after last year, looking like he could possibly uh, be finally uh, finally be pitching to his capabilities. They've come back quite a bit, and now only losing eight to six in the top of the seventh. So that'll be a game to keep an eye on. The Baltimore, uh, they've quite the offense. They got some home run power. They got hitters park for sure. So 
you know, two run game is kind of like Colorado. That's it's not really much of a lead, especially the Cubs team who has struggled uh, a little bit this year. Um, going back to the NL East, uh, the Phillies are currently losing to Milwaukee, nine to six. We're going to see Milwaukee come to DC once the Nats finish this uh, long road trip. They've been playing. They've They've been playing well this year. They've exceeded all expectations. Um, Atlanta is currently beating Arizona 4-3 in the top of the ninth. That would be a big win for the Braves. They've played really well uh, the last couple the last couple weeks, and now I've got Freddie Freeman back. they got Matt Adams playing well at first base. Uh, they got Julio Tehran pitching well on the road. You know, he struggles in that new SunTrust Park, but it's really a hitter's park. You saw what he did to the Nats. He's He started in – uh, last Saturday's game when the Nats were shut out for the first time this year. Um, we got uh, the Mets beat up on the Rockies big time tonight, 14-2. to uh, So that's a big win for the Mets team who's really fighting to try to get back in this race. And probably not going to catch the Nats, you would hope, but you know maybe they get hot. They could possibly go on a little run, maybe get back in the wild card race, make things interesting down the stretch. Uh the Marlins, they lost 6-4 to the Dodgers after uh, allowing a Yasiel Fui go-ahead home run in the ninth inning. So, yeah, those are always crushing crushing losses, which you know, we as Nats fans definitely know know very well this year with the bullpen struggles. So, it's never fun to blow a game in the ninth inning. So, uh, you really kind of feel for the Marlins fans, although with them seemingly being some of the Nats' uh, main competition along with Atlanta, you know, I'll take I'll take a loss for sure. Uh, we'll check the chat again. Uh, Judah Joker says the Ross injury also puts more pressure on Tanner Roark. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, Roark, after being one of the most consistent pitchers in the league the last several years, he's really struggled this year. You don't know why. Maybe it's a WBC. Maybe it's just mechanical issues. You hope he can figure it out. But you know, he's definitely struggled mightily this year. He pitched out of the bullpen in that. Uh, in that 13 to nothing game on Saturday against Atlanta, he looked, he definitely looked much improved. So hope he's starting on Sunday. Hopefully he can, uh, he can continue to improve and maybe we'll see him down the stretch. He'll return to his form from the last couple of years. And that's really need him to, if Ross is going to be out long-term and if Ross is out and Rourke is struggling, you, I mean, you really only have three starters assuming Edwin Jackson comes up and, you know, I I think maybe he can be a good arm and be a good, like, fifth starter, but I don't think he's going to be spectacular. So maybe you see the Nets go out and get a guy like Scott Feldman from Cincinnati who he's uh, he's pretty cheap. He's expiring this year. Maybe he's kind of just an arm, he's just a rental for this year. Uh, you'd think it wouldn't take too much to get him from the Reds who aren't really a contender. So, yeah, hopefully uh, – Roark is able to improve quickly. Uh, Ricky said, got to go with Jackson. Turner's been wild, and Jackson's earned it. Yeah, absolutely. Jacob Turner has not pitched well in his return to Syracuse, and Jackson has definitely impressed uh, after struggling with Baltimore. He came back here, and he's pitched well. He also Ricky also added, if Adams fixes his control, he's got good strikeout stuff. And yeah, you're absolutely right. This year – He's pitched well in AAA. The only the only uh, concern has been his walks have been a bit up. So, yeah, if he's able to just pound his zone, uh, let his defense work behind him, uh, I think he could pitch well in his big league team. And maybe we see him pitch well and Trevor God is the one to go down. And Adams gets a little bit of a shot, kind of like Sammy Solis did last year. Sammy Solis came up due to an injury, pitched really well, and ended up being one of their most used relievers down the stretch and in the playoffs. So. Yeah, Adams may get uh, an opportunity here, and hopefully he's able to take advantage of it. Uh, Judah Joker said, if Bryce or Max gets injured, I may have to become a bandwagon Yankees fan again. And, oh God, don't say that. You know, I don't know how many more injuries this team can take, but especially guy like Bryce Harper and Max Scherzer it'd be a huge blow. So hopefully they're able to avoid that. Although Harper has been a bit injury prone in the past, and Scherzer has pitched – I believe he's got the most pitches thrown in the majors this year. He's had some crazy outings throwing as many as like 120 pitches. So I guess you could definitely see it happening. This is not something you want to think about as a possibility. Um, 
we'll go a little bit into the game tomorrow. We got uh, Max Scherzer pitching for the Nats in his first start since his electric uh, electric All Star game performance, where he recorded two strikeouts. Um, so he got the All Star start that was much deserved. You'd think his main competition was Clayton Kershaw to get the start, but Kershaw was unavailable, and manager Joe Madden actually went out and said if Kershaw was available, Scherzer would still be the starter. And although Kershaw has probably been better over the last five or so years, this year and probably the last couple of years, I think Scherzer has absolutely been the better pitcher. Now, I may be a little bit biased, but you take a look at the numbers and just see what Scherzer is able to do every fifth day. Um, it's, it's, tough, it's tough to make an argument against him. Uh, so Scherzer will be on the mound, and he'll be opposed by Luis Castillo. So um, this should be a good game uh, in, out in Cincinnati. Ron will be with you for that one. Uh, check the chat one last time. Yeah, nothing new in the chat. Um, what went up on the site today? We had uh, Ricky had a great article, uh, five to watch to start the second half against Cincinnati. Uh, you got to check that out. See. Uh, how the players he predicted would be uh, five to watch, see how they did tonight. And I can tell you who it is. You got to go check it out. It's definitely a good read. Um, I had a piece about uh, our second half preview with Madison's Byron Kerr. We had, like I said, we had the uh, privilege of it, talking to him yesterday, talking a little bit about what we saw in the first half and what's to come in the second half. So that's a gr uh, that was a great interview. If you haven't checked it out, you, you get the time. You definitely should. Um, and uh, he provided a lot of great insight, including some fantastic injury news on Trey Turner, who originally we thought maybe he'd be back late August, early September. It should be, I'd take that for sure. I'd take that any day to have a chance to gear back up before the playoffs. But uh, Kerr actually said that Turner could return as soon as the first couple weeks of August. So that'd be great. You know, I've been going to a few games. Turner's out there before every game. He's running in the outfield, keeping his legs in shape. He's working out. So he Turner is doing everything he can to stay in shape. So once that wrist is healed, he can start swinging again, get his uh, swing right, start feeling a little bit. But he's definitely doing everything he can to not have to get back in shape once he's able to return. So he's handled that whole situation uh, very maturely. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see when he comes back and how he's able to return. Freddie Freeman with Atlanta suffered a similar injury, and he came back. And he's not only is he back, he's playing a different position, and he's raking as he always does. We saw he recently tortured the Nationals in that four-game series right before the break at Nationals Park. So hopefully Trey Turner is able to come back and provide a spark like he did last year when he came up and – have results similar to Freeman. Obviously, he's not going to be hitting the homers Freeman does, but if he's able to just get on base, make stuff happen with his legs, you know, that'd be phenomenal for the Nets. And Ron had a piece on Zach Britton uh, being a Nats trade target. John Heyman recently uh, reported that the Nats are interested in in Britain, and they've contacted the Orioles on Britain. And you know, with Britain being the elite closer that he is, I think most of the league will be interested in him. Heyman also reported that the Dodgers were looking at him as possibly uh, being an eighth inning guy for Kenley Jansen. That would be quite the um, eight, nine combo out in LA. And if they're able to do that, you really limit games to seven innings because Britain and Jansen are arguably the top closers in each league. Jansen currently in the NL and Britain in the AL, at least for now. So, you know, hopefully if the Nats have to face LA in the playoffs, they're not facing uh, the Dodgers with Zach Britton, and obviously if the Nats were able to acquire Britton, that would be an excellent addition, although it most likely going to be very costly uh, with him being the league closer that he is. So that's what we had go up on the site. Um, we appreciate it if you gave this video uh, a like and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Uh, give us a like on Facebook. We post all these on there, all our articles. We post a lot of good stuff on there. we got that page running really well. Uh, follow us on Twitter at District on Deck. You can follow me on Twitter at DrewRD98. And uh, that's all for me tonight. Ron will be with you tomorrow uh, with the Scherzer Sharks. So that will definitely be a fun one to watch. Hopefully another Nats win, and they can guarantee at least a series split here to begin the second half.
So uh, from the entire District on Deck staff, I'm Drew Douglas, and thank you for tuning in. Have a great night, everyone.